Welcome data enthusiasts. We are Zuma, the recruitment consultancy focused 100% on data professionals in and around the Berlin region. And this is our podcast, Data for Good, connecting you with all things data. Today, we're joined by Tamar Chate. Tamar is head of data science and product analytics at Forto. If you don't already know Forto, Forto is a Berlin-based business that offers a platform with a complete end-to-end -end supply chain management solution. Data science and machine learning also runs through the core of the product. So it's great that we've got Tamar with us today, uh, being an expert in this field. Tamar, how are you? Hi, Joseph. Um, thank you very much for having me in this podcast. I'm, I'm fine. Thank you very much. After a very busy summer, uh, now we are uh, launching the autumn and winter is coming to Berlin, but I'm feeling super excited for the upcoming quarters in the next year. Cool. Can you share with us what's made you so busy over the summer period? Uh, well, I think the audience audience is also very familiar with the chat GPT and Gen AI technologies that has been launched in, in March. Uh, after that launch, we were super excited how we can leverage those capabilities within Forto. And we did our research and created our own uh, you know, uh, environment to experiment some of those, some parts of those technologies. So it was super busy and exciting times, if you ask me, because I'm sure that it's going to create groundbreaking changes in our daily lives, especially for the companies like Fordo, uh, for startups that are uh, competing on the, you know, cost efficiency, operational efficiency area. So uh, it was it was super busy experimenting different uh, capabilities uh, in in connecting in connection with AI. Super, I would suggest watch this space uh, for your your customers and the supply chain industry generally speaking. Okay, and today our topic is to be recommendation systems or recommendation engines being that many of the ML and data science professionals that we speak to always speak about projects they've worked on in this field. It's great to get it from a leader as well. Could you give us an overview as to today's topic and why it's so relevant to you? Uh, so Joseph, um, first I would like to start about a very brief description of what a, what a recommender system is. Uh, it's a set of algorithms that actually suggest uh, users with products, services, in some cases for some apps, uh, people. Uh, why is it important? Because um, nowadays all the companies are actually looking for better customer engagements uh, and uh, higher conversion rates. And it is important to uh, know your customer you know, in, a, in a much more better way that you can sell more and more uh, to those customers. Just imagine you have a website or an app uh, and when a user lands to your you know, landing page, you have, I don't know, three, five seconds to get the attention of that customer with anything that you show them. So it is important that you really pick the right product, right service to show in that very limited time. And this is why we need recommendation systems uh, as part of that process, because without that, the only thing that you can do is, you know, show the best selling products, services, but mm -hmm. your competitors also have them in their websites as well. So you have to be more customized. You have to be more customer centric uh, in everything that you do so that uh, you differentiate yourself from your competitors. This is why uh, initially we need recommendation system and this is why it's so crucial. Um, when it comes to um, when it comes to the from a corporate perspective, from a, from a company wise perspective, of course, um, getting higher conversion is the key, because eventually you want to sell more, you want to uh, get higher levels of uh, you know sales or higher sales numbers. Uh, to do that, you have to really uh, hit the customer in a way that 
that is relatable. I mean, I'm not talking about just selling the most, uh, you know, expensive products uh, or selling the most affordable ones, but really uh, keeping the customer engaged with what is rel relatable uh, with them. This is how I can summarize. Yeah. The yeah, thank, thanks for that overview. Succinct. Uh, we, we can think of, well, Amazon, for example, recommendations throughout their product platform and for the user to understand that they're, they're being targeted with information that's relevant to them. And without recommendation systems, we'd get bombarded with information that's irrelevant and unattractive and unappealing, and that would turn us away from product exactly hmm. from from a customer perspective people are super busy right you're busy i'm busy we don't have time to go through all the you know options in the system in the website in the e-commerce website we need immediate results and results that is meaningful for us if you don't have this as a as, a, as an e-commerce company or a service provider company you are doomed to fail because uh, you will lose your customers to a competitor that is faster than you, that is, you know, that understands customer uh, better than you. Uh, Amazon is a really good example because I always say that, okay, these guys created this recommendation logic uh, 20 mm -hmm. years ago. And this is how they made money out of this, right? I mean, it's they were always trying to sell uh relatable additional items uh and in my opinion i mean they were the pioneers in the industry to create the overall you know algorithms logic uh 20 years ago mm -hmm. and with amazon it's not just recommending uh products that they think you'll like it's the additional ones it's recommending products in addition to what you've purchased yeah it, it, yeah quite very smart systems and we probably overlook them at this stage. How about in terms of process optimization, not just targeting, but how do recommendation engines or systems optimize processes in an organization? Um, it depends on how you manage your uh, overall uh, sales and product nation process. Uh, if you want to, I mean, if you're, manually handling all those processes it's really requires a lot of human effort to craft the right solution for your customers uh with a with a recommendation engine you have automated uh, you know uh process of your data so that it gives you uh, a specific recommendation for each of your customers so you don't have to worry about rule-based targeting you don't have to worry about uh, you mm. know, uh, missing some opportunities. If you have ongoing marketing campaigns, you don't have to worry about uh, the, you know, someone doing, finding the right set of customer. Um, with, a, with a recommendation engine, you already have uh, the propensities for each customer, the, each visitors. And then all you have to do is just fine tuning, just configuring it in a way that it you know adapts to the recent changes in the market, recent changes I don't know in the season. Uh, you just have to configure it from a process perspective. In my opinion, it's the uh, most convenient thing for uh, for I don't know revenue managers or marketing managers uh, because it removes a lot of manual work, a lot of you know uh, FTEs all at once. If the recommendation is uh, being configured properly, interesting. So yeah, lots of automation mentioned there. Um, and you talk about configuration. Could you share with us your own experience, probably your past experience, and learnings that have come, and maybe learnings that have come from the mistakes of uh, implementing recommendation systems? Is there a bad way to, to do so? If you don't have anything in place, there is no bad way of doing it. But if you already have some sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, rule-based targeting or someone's doing this targeting uh, thing, 
uh, yes, there are bad ways of doing it. In my past, um, let me start with how you measure actually the performance of a recommender system, and then we can you know continue how uh, what what types of mistakes can you can make. Um, first of all, a recommender uh, systems is is an algorithm. It gives you a set of I don't know products services to show to your customers. But there are alternatives to that, right? I mean, you can you can prepare a random list, ra random product list to show your customers. You can uh, show your customers the uh, ever best selling products or the best selling products of the I don't know last three months. These are all strategies that you can implement. And um, when when we say configuration, we actually mean finding the best option among these ones. In my past, I always had. Uh, I mean, my team always created these three main strategies. One is the random sets. So we were just showing mm -hmm. products to our customers. The second set is the best selling products. And the third set is the recommendation set. And we were regularly measuring and comparing the performance of these three. When, when I say performance, I mean the conversion rate and the, the revenues. Uh, we were comparing these three sets to understand which one performs better. There are some times, very interestingly, that best-selling products performs better than the recommendations. There are some times, of, I mean, in majority of the cases, the recommendation list actually performs way better than the best-selling and, of course, the uh, than the random set. But this is this is really important to understand that you need a baseline measurement for uh, any changes, mm -hmm. for any configurations that you do. Once we have this baseline calculation for the random set for the best sellers and, and the Aziz performance of the recommendation engine, uh, we were um, trying and experimenting different strategies by changing the algorithm, by, uh, I don't know, in some cases, adding some rule-based uh, sets and rule-based recommendations by mixing them uh, with the algorithm. Uh, because uh, especially in e-commerce, there are some seasons that you need to uh, boost some of the products. For example, if it's Valentine's Day, I mean, you cannot just recommend anything. You have to create your recommendation list based on the theme of that time. The Christmas uh, is another season or the summer season. So you, it is not always, you know, 100% an algorithm that gives you the best list that you can have. You always have to uh, look into, uh, you know, some opportunities to create it in a much more better way. Uh, mm. These are the config configurations uh, that we used to do uh, all the time to uh, improve the performance, overall performance of the recommender engine. And the KPI we were just looking is the conversion rates and the, the overall, you know, uh, profit we get between the between these three groups. Uh, theoretically, uh, if you configure your algorithm uh, properly, uh, it outperforms all the other alternatives because it's you know driven such as best selling or random set. Exactly, random set for sure, but for best selling, uh, it must be outperforming it. Uh, okay, this... so that's one of the ways that you know. That's one of the ways to understand that you've built an efficient recommendation engine if it outperforms the alternatives. Exactly, exactly. And in some cases, I mean, the, the team was always trying to find a better uh, configuration uh, to outperf outperform the existing recommendation as well, because it's a, it's a space mm. that has global maximums, local minimums. You always have to find your way on that never ending space. And this is only possible by changing the algorithm, by changing the data. One of the best things, I think, I mean, this was not a mistake, but but uh, something that we really utilized to improve the performance was uh, ingesting the real-time data. Because um, you can't know all of your customers uh, because uh, majority of the visitors are also uh, to your website or to your mobile application are new customers. You have almost no idea who is visiting that page. And it is important to capture the real-time behavior 
so that you don't have to rely on the historical data in your systems. If you understand that that customer is looking for, I don't know, um, children's shoes, uh, you understand it after two, three page visits, and then you can ingest, just ingest this data to your recommendation engine. At that point, you have an idea about that customer, what they're interested in, and it becomes mm. better and better all the time. This was a step. It was a huge step uh, in my past uh, when we were, you know, designing or conf configuring the recommendation engines. It was ingesting the real time data. Would that also be, yeah, a, a reason to keep it continuous? continuously in ingesting real-time data if you think about that case with somebody buying children's shoes at some point the children's shoes are going to be bigger so they're going to need different sizes and, and different styles etc hmm. exactly okay thanks for putting it in context for me okay um so there's been some learnings there particularly around the different approaches are there any other learnings that you'd share about better ways of implementing recommendation systems? Um, so one one big problem is actually the cold start problem, as I as star I mean, star problem, cold cold start problem. Oh, as cold I, start, right? Got it. Yeah, yeah. Um, as I mentioned, I mean, in my past, almost half of the users were. Uh, just a new user. So we didn't have any idea about their preferences or behavior. As a, as a designer of a recommender system, you need to find a solution for that cold start problem because you have no idea about half of your uh, users. Uh, it is always a good idea um, to look into some demographics to the maximum extent that you can collect uh generally uh people think that uh, they they start a conversation saying that we have no idea about this customer but no it's it's not correct all the time you know uh, you can detect the location you can detect where this com customer is or this user is landing to your page from it might be from a google search or some other page and even though you don't have you have nothing you can track the first two, three steps of that customer to understand, to have it have a general understanding of the expectations. And of course, uh, these very few number of footprints of the customer is never enough to, you know, recommend anything. This is why you need to do a lot of very sophisticated segment segmentation of your uh, unknown customers by utilizing every bits of data that they leave in your systems. Uh, but it's always a always a challenging thing. It's not not that easy. Uh, it's like uh, just think of a uh, I don't know a shopping mall. Someone entering from the door, and all you have is just you see that person, and you try to understand what to show them. Uh, it's really really difficult. Uh, there there are different uh, as I said strategies to do that. Our strategy was to uh, collect all the information we can collect from the very beginning and by real-time segmenta segmenting them uh, and real-time um, detecting what is the best product to offer to that group of customer uh, in real time uh, was, the, was the best we could do uh, back then. Um, another challenge, another difficult thing is the data quality. Uh, especially in e-commerce, um, the, the the product catalog is huge generally, right? It's not just one T-shirt or a shirt. It also has the, uh, you know, colors, sizes, I don't know, prints on it. So you have thousands, millions of records that you can process uh, and you can feed into your recommendation system. The first question that needs to be asked, in my opinion, is uh, what should be the right level of granularity? Because the more deep you go in the in your product tree, you fa you start facing a lot of data quality problems because mm. it's always not that easy to maintain the quality of the you know uh, of the data all the time for millions of records, millions of products. 
Um, but if you go too high on the product tree, this doesn't make sense because it just gives you, oh, you should recommend a t-shirt to the customer. But how, which t-shirt you have, I don't know, thousands of t-shirts in your uh, in your product catalog. So as a, as, a, as, a, as data people, as data scientists or recommend their system designers, uh, it's really um, difficult to uh, find the optimal point where to stop uh, in the in the product tree or the service tree uh, when doing those recommendations. Um, in my past, we generally stopped at level three, which is this, uh, it's a garment, then a t-shirt, then a, 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 you know, this type of t-shirt. Going below was making things too complicated without bringing, bringing, bringing any additional value. But these mm -hmm. are the things uh, these are the things, as I said, were the challenge. Maybe last last topic I can mention is, I briefly also talked about it, this real-time perspective of it. Doing batch recommendation is good if you don't have anything. But ingesting real-time data, I think it's super important because, I mean, I'm sure that um, you have seen cases similar to, to, to this. You... You, you look for a product, you add it to your uh, basket, then after two, three pages, the the e-commerce web page recommends it to you again, even though it's in your basket. This mm. is very this is a very common uh, problem of any recommender system, any e-commerce system. So and this is an indication of uh, the lack of real-time data ingestion. If uh, the system understands that it's in your uh, basket, it doesn't recommend you that product again and again. So this is another thing I think uh, the machine learning data scientists, people should be uh, careful about when they're designing uh, their internal recommender systems. Mm. I, I'm, I'm getting that you've had a, a lot of experience in the um, FMCG e-commerce domain. I wonder if you can talk about some of the successes you've had and who they impacted and you know how it impacted the business that you work for. Um, so recommend recommender systems are generally used in you know uh, e-commerce, uh, not FMCG, but generally in e-commerce and in service providing companies. So any other uh, types of recommendations are are actually not. Uh, good use cases to you know to talk about. Uh, I'm not talking about failure cases, but the impact is super high because it is first of all it's digital and it's dynamic. Um, in my past, actually, I was working for a tele telecommunication company, and we were also uh, trying to find the best offer for our customers. It was a preliminary version of the of a recommendation uh, engine. It was not real time. It was pure batch. It was we were running it once a once a week or so. Uh, but com when I compare it with the with the e commerce, the success was limited uh, because the, it's a little bit related with the decision process of the users as well. Because mm -hmm. when you see an offer real time on a web page, you either I mean you you can immediately decide to buy it but if you are making a recommendation for a product that is not digitally sold it takes i mean you as a as a company you miss the customer right there are a lot of distractions uh, maybe you are just uh, you know uh, looking into the competitors products it is not real time this is why recommender systems are best for the digital businesses compared to non digital businesses um, maybe I can very briefly give a different perspective from logistics. Uh, right now, we are trying to, I mean, as far as uh, we are a freight forwarder that is trying to digitalize the transportation process. And what we're doing is, uh, what we're trying to build is to create uh, action recommendations instead of product recommendations. Because in e-commerce, what you sell is the product itself. Uh, but in logistics, it is actually the actions that is critical that makes you different from the other other freight forwarders. And uh, supporting your users with action recommendations is the key for differentiating you. 
uh, this part actually we are right now working on um, and we are trying to build a different type of a recommendation engine not working on products but working on uh, what would be the best next step for a customer or an internal user uh, while they're handling their uh, their shipments very interesting so this would uh, action recommendation system okay are, are they quite common then um, as a comparative approach um, not 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 as common as uh, other recommendation systems in e-commerce and for a data scientist of any level is that any more complex to build it is way complex than the, the, the traditional recommender engines because you have a catalog of products in a in a traditional recommender engine and all you have to do is understand the customer understand the product just create your own algorithm to match them and give it as a uh, as a recommendation however action recommendations are by characteristics really different because you need to understand the process it is not just a user landing to your page. It is actually something happening that is within the course of the shipment. And at that moment, you need to be aware of the context. You need to be aware of the options that you can recommend. And you need to find the best one considering the future of the, uh, of the shipment. Uh, what it makes it different is that you have to consider not only what's happening right now, but also what will happen in the future by forecasting the steps of the shipment and make your decision and recommendation based on those, uh, based on what is coming uh, in the in the future. This part is different. As I said, in digital e-commerce, it is that moment, you have to capture that moment and you have to do your recommendation properly. But in logistics or any process related industry, I mean, I can generalize it that, it that way, you have to mm. be aware of the context, what's happening right now, plus what will the uh, what the future will bring to you uh, as part of the process. Mm. And in the logistics domain, where there are so many different variables being so many different processes all attached to one another, I, I could see how that quickly becomes very complex. Right. Thanks for sharing that. That's one for us all to look out for then, action recommendation systems. In kind of bringing this all together, <clears throat> excuse me, I wonder, as a data science leader, what philosophies have you taken regarding implementing and maintaining recommendation engines? And, and with that, I'm thinking of the strategic and the operational, something that would be useful for other data leaders to, to take from you. Um, I always start with the being customer centric. Uh, you have to understand customers needs and expectations, and you have to find a way to merge them, merge those expectations with the company objectives. Uh, you can create the best recommendation engine uh, with, a cost, with, a, with a company perspective, uh, you can offer the best priced high markup products, but it doesn't matter as long as uh, no one buys it. Uh, but on the other hand, you have to be taking care of your customers in a way that they are engaged with your recommendations. So you need to find all the data leaders that are really listening to us need to understand they have to find the optimal points of uh, understanding the customer and combining it with the commercial objectives of the company that they are working for. This has always been my North Star when I'm designing everything. Uh, I actually try to avoid uh, the, you know, how to say it, uh, meta exercising, uh, doing it just for the sake of doing it, uh, creating algorithms for the sake of creating it. No, it should create an impact it should either have a commercial impact or a customer impact, and everything starts with 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 the customers for me. This is one one of the philosophies that I uh, I have uh, when I'm when I was designing or leading the teams designing the recommender system systems. Um, the second the second uh, philosophy I can 
I can call out as uh, experimenting all the time because there is no best uh, best configuration, best algorithm uh, that solves your problem. You have to look into other ways of doing it. I mean, I know this sounds super cliche, very generic, but this is the, the only way that you can perfectionize uh, your algorithms and get better results. Uh, once you have uh, one recommendation system in place, it's good to have uh, in the first version, It's everyone is super happy because you're really moving the needle. But in the second version and the third version, the impact, incremental impact uh, diminishes, which is which makes sense, right? I mean, you just hit it at once and you get the maximum uh, impact. And then the next version, the third version uh, is not as good as the initial impact. Uh, but this doesn't necessarily be that way. There are several algorithms uh, that are openly available, publicly available. And um, we as data people, uh, should never stop experimenting those those algorithms. Uh, data science by nature is, is an occupation in my mind. Uh, is something that you never stop experimenting. You always try new algorithms. You change your data. You change your experiment design. You change your sampling. You, you can change a lot of things to find the real, uh, to find a better uh, performing, a higher performing algorithm. And I think this is, this is the key uh, thing that should be, uh, you know, taken away by the by the people who are listening to us today. Customer centric and balance that. Find the optimum ground between understanding the needs and expectations of the customer as well as the business direction, and experiment all the time. Be dynamic, just like our, our world is dynamic. Um, I, I love those. Yeah, very very strong. Um, and, and I think that that's a message for leaders as well as senior or um, individual contributors. Take that mindset, always think about the customer, always think about experimenting. Um, exactly. Okay. This all comes from the, from the leaders, right? I mean, if you uh, direct your team with this mindset, they will eventually develop this experimenting sense as a skill uh, otherwise mm -hmm. they're going to deliver you know, their algorithms or their models and uh, they will wait for another direction to improve them but if you if you somehow immune them with this sense of uh, sense of experimenting i think it is it's uh, really valuable for everyone in the in this community fantastic um, Tama, that is all we've got time for today. And uh, it's been a great insight into recommendation systems, but also the philosophies and approaches that you've taken and that you would recommend for other people. So thanks so much. And you mentioned your busy summer there. I hope next time we, we could have the opportunity to talk about generic generative AI and uh, how it's being used in, in your industry area. Thank you very much, Joseph, for having me. It was super uh, fun to, you know, talk about some of the stuff that was uh, really interesting to talk. Uh, in the next time, yes, why not? Generative AI is a super attractive topic. I think everyone is super excited about what is, uh, is going to be out of it uh, eventually. Let's let's mm. in touch on this topic. Yeah, let's keep in touch. I think removing the mystique of generative generative AI and actually putting it into into a case example uh, of how it's useful and helpful and will help a business progress. Um, that that would be really cool. Thanks, Tama. See you next time. Thank you, Joseph. See you. Bye bye.